Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here with this community and to have the opportunity to share this event. My name is uh, Ana Lorenzo. I'm a GIS consultant at the GIS Center for Health at WHO. Um, and I'm part of the team of COVAX uh, WHO UNICEF Working Group. This is the second event of our COVAX Geospatial Health Community of Practice. For the ones that were not uh, present on the first one and would like to know more information about what we will be doing during the sessions, I would like to invite you to uh, hear the recording of the last event that I will ask our um, colleagues from Dev Global to paste the link in the chat. And now I'll pass to some uh, housekeeping. Can you pass the slide, please? Thank you. So just click your uh, mic muted unless uh, you, you will be requested to speak and indicate your affiliation in the Zoom display name so we can identify you. Uh, and now, before I, uh, we pass to the detailed agenda, I would like to give you a brief overview of the subject of this session. So the country needs on the context of COVID-19 and therefore the COVAX agenda is shifting from the focus on the distribution of delivery of COVID vaccines in the context of the pandemic response to the integration of COVID-19 vaccines into routine immunization, integrated service, delivery, and primary uh, healthcare strength. So in the context of this community, we will discuss on what role and added value geospatial solutions can bring to the COVAX agenda on the integration of COVID-19 vaccination into immunization programs and the primary healthcare. Um, the detailed agenda will be, Next slide, yes. We will have a, a speaker presentation um, that will be uh, performed by our colleagues from WHO uh, and UNICEF. The presentation will be on the rest, recent uh, WHO UNICEF programmatic guidance on how to achieve integration of COVID-19 vaccination into immunization programs and primary health care. Um, and then we will have um, questions and answers. We would like you to participate and uh, and to give you and to propose some questions if you have or comments. We we'll have some time for this around ten minutes. Uh, and after we will have an interactive session where we will uh, invite you to actually active participate uh, on this community by um, based on the recommendations that were presented, and especially on the required investments. Uh, to participate in the group discussion about the role and the added value of geospatial solutions to this uh, COVAX agenda. But we will explain a, bit, a little bit further how this will work and how we, you will be invited to participate. And in the last minutes of this session, we will have our colleague Joanna from the Jazz Center um, at WHO speaking about the updates uh, related to the handbook of geo-enabled uh, microplane. I will now invite our speakers uh, to present the recent uh, UNICEF and WHO operation guidance on how to achieve integration of COVID-19 vaccination into immunization programs and primary health care. Welcome. Uh, I would like you to please introduce yourselves uh, and thank you for being here with us. Thank you, Anna, and thank you, colleagues. Um, um, myself and Alba will be presenting uh, on behalf of the group. I'm Ibrahim Dadari, Immunization Specialist, um, UNICEF HQ, uh, Immunization Coverage and Equity. Uh, and I have Alba here as well. She's a technical officer in WHO HQ in Geneva. So I'll take the first part of the slides, and then Alba is going to uh, complete this set of slides. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so basically we, we, we understood that there will be a need to uh, ultimately integrate COVID-19 vaccination into routine immunization and other um, health services, including strengthening PHC. Um, so basically um, we developed this guideline and it's been disseminated. So 
through this uh, brief presentation, we'll be going through why integration of COVID vaccine. Um, uh, what are the country experiences to date uh, on integration of COVID-19 vaccine? Um, what steps and available tools are there to operationalize or help countries to operationalize the integration of COVID-19 vaccine? Uh, and also, what are the key messages? Um, basically, uh, the objective of the guideline is to lay out key programmatic considerations uh, for moving from the uh, current mass uh, campaigns for COVID-19 vaccine, which is happening, um, to more of streamlining and integrating um, COVID-19 vaccination into immunization programs, uh, both routine and supplemental, then PHC, and also other relevant health services. As you know, um, a lot of the risk groups are beyond the scope of uh, EPI um, target population. Target group. Next slide, please. Uh, so basically, you can find um, the current uh, version of the guideline on the TechNet uh, uh, website. So we have it currently both in English and French. Um, and of course, I think we're doing the final copy editing. And once it's fully published, it will be available uh, in most or all of the platforms where you access guidelines and tools, of course, including WHO and UNICEF. Uh, our website. Next, so you can click the links. Any if uh, for English is the first link. For French is the second. You could access it from the TechNet and also go through it, as well as use it for our program uh, planning and implementation. Next slide, please. Okay. So. Uh, Basically, uh, we felt that there are four key uh, reasons uh, why we're integrating or trying to uh, uh, support or guide uh, integration. First is looking at the epidemiological situation of COVID-19. Um, there were some scenario analysis that were conducted, of course, by uh, WHO, and then we looked at the most likely scenario, which is um, a situation where COVID-19 Will uh, infections or uh, disease will persist, um, requiring periodic boosters uh, for high risk groups. These are the elderly, um, those with chronic or underlying comorbidities. Uh, so perhaps that is mo the most likely scenario. Um, then the second uh, point is sustainability. We know that this is a pandemic response. Uh, once the pandemic uh, is declared over, of course, we expect that systems should revert back to normal, right? Um, so it's, it will not be sustainable to have a parallel COVID-19 vaccination program for uh, perpetuity. So based on that, um, we're trying to move, it, move away um, from the current um, more of outbreak or pandemic response mode to a more streamlined, um, routine kind of uh, service delivery mode. Um, so that is that, as well as use the opportunity uh, to strengthen PHC. Then the third one is leveraging resources. We, there's a lot of resources being pumped in. Um, uh, we feel that uh, it's good to leverage resources to strengthen the primary health care system and as uh, pandemic preparedness and also possibly that to uh, make us better prepared to respond to future pandemics uh, when it happens. Uh, then, as you know, uh, we have the life course approach to vaccination. So basically, uh, we're trying to optimize delivery platforms across the life course. Uh, of course, uh, COVID-19 vaccine being part of that, that integrated package um, towards achieving the goals of uh, IA2030 agenda. Next slide, please. Okay, so we looked at uh, a number of guidelines and documents. As you know, defining uh, integration can be uh, quite challenging, um, but we managed to come up with a, a definition to, to suit this specific uh, case. Um, uh, so basically the proposed definition is the partial or full adoption of COVID-19 vaccines into national immunization programs, um, primary health care and other relevant services with the overall aim of first is <clears throat> improving program efficiency and sustainability. Um, as we know, we can't have in parallel systems, uh, governance systems, um, 
isn't as efficient as trying to streamline <clears throat> and also the sustainability point I made. Then second point is enhancing demand and improving user satisfaction. So we channel um, the efforts, the resources towards uh, a common agenda of creating or uh, stimulating demand, as well as improving user satisfaction with all the resources rather than spin it up. Um, the third point is achieving and maintaining satisfactory coverage. Um, yes, uh, COVID-19 uh, vaccines are uh, during the pandemic response mode. We're trying to uh, try to reach as many high risk uh, population as possible. Uh, once we reach a certain threshold, we feel that it will be good to integrate. In fact, some countries are facing challenges. We, we, we've spoken with many countries. Some actually felt that they prefer to integrate uh, earlier such that system building or system strengthening uh, part actually starts much earlier. So that is that. And then addressing inequities, we hope that with the integration, uh, more inequities uh, will be addressed across different um, strata, across different um, uh, population groups, the urban, poor, remote, rural, complex, uh, nomadic, or pastoralist communities, um, et cetera. Next slide, please. So, uh, WHO and UNICEF conducted uh, a survey to understand uh, the extent of integration. Um, as at, uh, the, the UNICEF was in December, WHO did that in, in January, February. So, we sent out a questionnaire to country offices to try to gauge what is the level of integration. So, as we know, some form of integration is already happening in the countries. Uh, but that actually depends uh, or varies from country to country. Some are much more integrated than others. Some have a almost completely vertical COVID-19 vaccine delivery platform, while others physically are uh, almost fully utilizing the uh, routine immunization platform or PHC set, uh, platforms as well. Um, but the combined result of the uh, survey showed that uh, certain services are more integrated than others. For instance, when you look at coaching capacity, you could see all the blues signifying more of integration uh, than uh, non-integration. Um, as compared to when you look at um, uh, items like planning for human resources or uh, data and information, uh, even vaccine delivery strategies, you see some less integration as compared to, to, to cold chain and supply chain. So, uh, so some of it, of course, can be explained. You understand the complexities uh, at the country level. But of course, this varies from country to country. Next slide, please. Um, so there are some country examples and experiences on integration. Um, these are just few uh, we're highlighting. Of course, we know there are much more. Um, for instance, in Panama, the, the, the co-delivery of COVID-19 uh, vaccine and influenza vaccines. So during the 2022 vaccination week of the Americas, um, co-administration of COVID-19 uh, and influenza vaccines for high-risk groups and facilities and house-to-house -house, uh, approaches was done. Sri Lanka also had uh, a combined delivery strategy uh, where routine immunization sessions uh, provided opportunity to screen parents for COVID-19 boosters. Uh, as well as to uh, provide the motivate for, uh, for immunization. Cambodia, um, similar integrating non-NCD um, screening, uh, a pilot of over 40 uh, with diabetes hypertension screening while also they're receiving their COVID-19 vaccine. Of course, a lot of countries perhaps did similar. Um, Nigeria had the whole family approach, specific regions adopted the family approach, uh, which combines um, COVID-19 vaccination uh, with healthcare services uh, like uh, childhood vaccination, uh, malnutrition and screening for NCDs. And of course, we know some countries like Zambia, uh, they're using um, uh, digital and geospatial uh, enabled micro planning uh, for routine and COVID-19 vaccine delivery. Next slide, please. So, um, Digital innovations, of course, uh, a lot of digital innovations were introduced for COVID-19 uh, and which have a broader benefit for, uh, for routine immunization. 
And within the guideline, you're going to see that we, we emphasize uh, the need to look at those innovations that have been tested and shown to be uh, of great value to be scaled up um, during the integration phase, such that EPI can also benefit from the in uh, innovations that came out uh, due to the COVID-19 response. Um, Jamaica is an example. Uh, they have a digital health platform to manage the national COVID-19 vaccine deployment. Uh, so this is basically the COVID-19 vaccine registration system, which is ComCare, launched in 2021. Uh, uh, more than uh, 765,000 individuals have been recorded so far. Hundreds of uh, over 100,000 paper forms have been entered into the digital platform. Thousands of healthcare workers are trained. Um, so basically, it's a kind of now superset dashboard for visualization. Um, with uh, digital COVID-19 vaccine certifications being rolled out as of December 2021. So also with this, uh, thinking uh, how to maximize the investments for routine immunization. Um, there's also another uh, example, COVID-19 vaccine matchmaking in DRC using SMS to match uh, uh, the target population equipping health workers uh, on the front line adapted to COVID-19 um, digital resources in certain countries like Liberia, um, DRC, and Togo. Um, so these are some of the few examples of uh, <clears throat> what has happened. Hopefully, these are innovations that will be scaled up um, to impact not only the immunization services, but the PHC and other uh, health uh, delivery platforms as well. So I hand over to my colleague, um, Alba uh, from the WHO, who will now update the second part of the presentation. Alba, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ibrahim, and for providing the overview about what we mean by integration. I'm going to focus more on the how to integrate because this is where we're getting a lot of questions. Next, please. So how to personalize integration of COVID vaccination? The guidance that WTO UNICEF developed proposes four steps. Step one, initiating and building on integration. This is step two, planning and developing a country, plan, and a country integration plan. Step three, implementation and monitoring. And a step four, afterwards, like the post-integration follow-up actions. So for the first one, it's really important. And it's about how we set up a group that it could be a COVID related group, COVID vaccination, or it could be of an existing um, relevant body that it's related to immunizations or other programs. And in order to be able to coordinate and to start the discussions on this topic. So as part of the document, there is an annex, annex two, that includes this table. This is just a screenshot. I'm not planning for you to be able to read, but at least you can get a sense that by health system building block, that means that we're considering integration from the broad sense. It's not only about integration doesn't mean only, like I can give you a vaccine COVID, for example, plus another health intervention, like, uh, for example, follow up of pregnancy. It also means that how we can leverage from health system perspective, different pieces that have been um, leveraged for COVID, for example, information systems, SMS reminders, I mean, social listening um, tools to be able to generate demand, also advocacy groups, how to engage with CSOs. So there are a series of questions that are able or are hopefully are able to support countries to assess what's their readiness, what's their status on integration, to respond yes or no, and based on that to be able to identify if there is a need of follow-up actions. This is the first step. Next. The second one, it's all the discussions and a lot of thinking that needs to be put in order to define what here we define as A, B, C, D. A, define a national policy for COVID vaccine booster doses. That means who is gonna be vaccinated, which groups, are we talking about general population? Are we talking only about high risk groups? So I'm gonna provide some potential responses to these questions in the coming slides. Beats what other interventions could be delivered at the same time of COVID vaccine. 
Third, it's see it's what, where. It could be in a health facility, it could be COVID um, that could be delivered COVID vaccine in the market and then could be combined with another intervention. So we're gonna try to map that. And then D, it's about what it's needed, resources, what are the short-term investments and actions that need to happen in order to be able to do so. Next, please. So A, for defining a, a national policy, we have to consider what are the latest WTO SAGE recommendations on booster doses. So to date, their latest recommendation says that there is no recommendation for a booster dose for children that are less than 12 years old, except that there are children that they have immunocompromising conditions. That means that the future of COVID vaccination program, it's focusing in adults mainly. The second piece is which vaccines could be used. So you can use either the same vaccine for all doses, for a primary series and then booster doses, or it could be mixed also. So you can use one type of vaccine product for primary series and then for booster doses others. And the recommendations, who should get these booster doses for the first and second one, you can see the five main groups here in this slide and are exactly the same five main groups that are the high risk groups. And I wanna highlight that we are not thinking about the need for boosters for a general population. So everyone, only the focus will be, or we think that it will be for the five main groups, which are healthcare workers, older persons, immunocompromised, adult with comorbidities, I mean, diabetes, people with um, cardiopathies or lung diseases and pregnant women. So between the finalization of the primary series and the first booster dose, the recommendations between four and six months and between the first booster dose and the second one, the recommendation is four, six months. And the question that we're getting a lot is, and after that, the what? What's gonna happen in 2023 and beyond? So Sage has said that probably it's likely that additional doses might be needed, but it's not clear yet if it's gonna be once a year or twice a year, because the interval that has been said to date is between four and 12 months. As more evidence becomes available, we should be able to figure out this. Next. So having defined that it's not general population, it's high risk groups mainly, and this is where most of the severity, so it means people who are, might end up at the hospital or might die from COVID are the main priority. Then what other interventions could be provided at the same time of COVID vaccination? So one option is that you have the adults that are coming for other services, and for example, pregnant women as part of their follow-up in NANC clinics, they can be provided COVID vaccine. Or also um, Tanzania, for example, they partner with um, chronic disease services to be able to provide to people with HIV, with HIV treatment at the same time of COVID vaccination. There is also other alliances with the idea that WASH, so hygiene kit distribution could be provided at the same time of COVID. Or there are also examples of how to do hypertension screening or diabetes screening at the same time of providing COVID vaccine. The other opportunity, and this is where also your community can play a role, it's how can we use the routine childhood vaccination in order to be able to identify who needs a COVID booster. And that could be the grandparents, it could be the parents, so mainly the adults that are gonna go with their children. Next. And on administration, which other vaccines could be administered at the same time? So I mean that you can administer COVID in one arm and then another vaccine in the other one. So any type of vaccine, polio, measles, yellow fever, influenza, HPV, could be administered at the same time as COVID in adults and adolescents. For children, the evidence would require more evidence to be able to make the same recommendation. And until now, the recommendation is to wait 14 days between vaccines. Next. C, establish a combination of service delivery strategies. So where COVID vaccines could be uh, delivered, it could be in a routine mode with the idea that we move from mass vaccination campaigns to the health facilities. It could be in a fixed site or as an outreach. Fixed site doesn't need to be only health facilities. 
It could be also in pharmacies. It could be in non-communicable dis non disease clinics, HIV and TB clinics, A and C. Outreach, particularly for elderly population, where can we find them? So in long-term facilities, nursing homes, or maybe visiting them at home and providing the vaccine. Campaign mode is also another way of providing COVID vaccine and could be, that's also a way of integrating it. It could be temporary site places like marketplaces or, or refugee camps or places, home visits, or it could be as a mass vaccination. It's not that there is a menu that it's gonna work for all countries. Every single country needs to, to define what's their context, what's the maturity of their health system. And, in, and based on that, to be able to define what different service delivery options could be provided. Next. And D, and this is where also your group and your brainstorming session could be really relevant. So countries have been provided through Gavi the opportunity to apply to receive support from the CDS, the third window of support funding to be able to um, also fund integration of COVID. And this is not only about co-delivery, so it means co-administrating COVID vaccine with something else. It's also about this health system. And if we focus on the information management, the number four, there are opportunities there to be able to request funds to Gavi to be able to leverage COVID vaccine platforms to expand, for example, HMIS, also to strengthen vaccine preventability disease surveillance, to strengthen IFI, I mean, safety systems, and develop electronic registries for high-risk groups. But there is also space for innovations and any GIS that could be able to identify, for example, unreached communities or how to, the, to, how to reach elderly, people with chronic diseases, how to be able to map them, how to be able to identify where is the closer health facility that they can go. All of that could be relevant in order to think about the future of COVID vaccination. Next. And finally, to end with three key messages. The first one, is it now the time to plan for integration and sustainable COVID vaccination? And it's important to really um, engage programs beyond national immunization programs, and also to consider other stakeholders, like all your, your initiatives and institutions. Leveraging COVID vaccine innovations, including just special solutions, it's important to strengthen immunization system and also the health system by itself. The second is as countries begin or build on an integration, WHO and UNICEF regional offices and country offices will be available to provide support and guidance. And finally, this is a huge opportunity to be able to strengthen and to move from only being childhood vaccination to a life course immunization where we can strengthen, where we know that there are the adult vaccination platforms are so optimal and there is an opportunity to work towards the immunization agenda, strategic priorities and goals. So thank you so much. We'll remain here for any questions you might have. Thank you, Ibrahim and Alba. It was really a clear presentation. Thank you for the good work. Uh, we would like now to hear from the community which questions you would like to address to our speakers. Please raise your hand if you want to speak. I do not see any hands raised for now. Oh, Maybe. we have we have three people in the queue. Okay, uh, <laughs> great, Jeff. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, Moritz Leonard, I think, came up first. Okay, please go ahead. Okay, thank you very much, so Moritz Leonard, uh, geospatial data lead at Blue Square. Um, I was just wondering. Um, I mean, I, th I think, thank you very much for the presentation. I think it's an obvious movement, obviously, to 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 integrate COVID into the, the general uh, system. Um, 
there's a lot going on right now within the general system as well, both in terms of campaigns and in terms of routine vaccination, in terms of digitization of all that. How much have you looked at, let's say, integrating what is happening with COVID and COVAX into the, the current movements in terms of digitization for all the other types of, of, of vaccinations that are ongoing right now? Thank you. Ibrahim and Alba, you would like to go ahead or should we uh, hear other questions? How you prefer? Yeah, maybe take other questions and we respond. Yes. Sure. Uh, Sergio, uh, please come in. Hello, thank, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate the, the wonderful work that you are doing. We really do appreciate it. Uh, my first, uh, my main question, uh, Moritz already raised it. Uh, here in Mozambique, we have uh, many and different systems. Uh, all of them that are also looking to support the healthy system. So um, I, I wanted to, to understand if the system that uh, what's up you are developing could be integrated on the national system that already uh, are running in the in the countries over thank you thank you sergio um i believe it's urina if i see well the line yeah thanks um uh, first i would like to thank all of you for the presentation um, for the integration, I just have one question. It's about uh, <clears throat> the date of expiration of the, the vaccine, because um, in our uh, cases, like in uh, Mali, Guinea, and uh, Senegal, we have uh, the vaccine doses like uh, for one month or three months of expiration. Is it? Um, I just wonder if this period is aligned um, to the to the routine vaccination um, expiration that has left. So uh, if not, how how did you uh, manage this kind of challenges? Oh, thanks. Do okay. we have any more uh, hands raised? I don't think so, right? I don't think so, yeah. I think you can go ahead then. And okay, so I'll just give you the stop and then Alba will come in and maybe the uh, Anna yourself, uh, Roku or somebody can come in as well to uh, supplement. Uh, basically, um, this is a guideline um, to guide countries um, on how to integrate. It, it doesn't really dictate the specifics because each country um, situation differs. As you saw from the survey, um, different countries have different levels of integration. So, uh, but looking specifically at the digital innovations, we, as I mentioned uh, in the slide presentation, we, within the guideline, specified that countries where there are digital innovations and solutions which have been applied to COVID uh, vaccine delivery and have been proven to be um, effective, uh, it's a good opportunity to actually leverage uh, those uh, for routine immunization. So it's clear. We, we, uh, the guideline doesn't, it's not really prescriptive, uh, but just mentions that countries can do that because there are a lot of factors uh, that come to play country dynamics, um, stakeholders within the country, availability of resources to do that. So th those are, are factors that um, cannot be controlled uh, at the global level. Uh, but countries are advised, and we have within the guideline itself, there's a checklist which helps you to look at how ready or how prepared uh, specific uh, interventions or digital innovations are, what stage are they such that uh, uh, they will be, are they ripe enough for you to integrate? Uh, and where that is, where you apply the checklist or guideline, which uh, I think Alba had on the screenshot, um, and it shows that maybe there are issues, perhaps the decision will be made by the country stakeholders whether to integrate. Um, yes, we, we acknowledge, as Maurice said, there are a lot of digital solutions happening in countries, digital platforms trying to um, uh, deliver or accelerate delivery of COVID-19 vaccines, but some might be very useful for COVID-19, uh, for routine immunization and PHC, and we recommend that those could be looked into by the countries. 
to uh, be integrated. But then for Mozambique, Sergio, um, we just give an example of how uh, on the slides, how uh, Mozambique is using geospatial uh, micro plans to uh, plan uh, service delivery for COVID-19 vaccine as well as um, routine immunization. Uh, it's a country uh, led uh, in implementation and of course, as I mentioned, the countries uh, the liberty to scale up. And we actually encourage um, some of this as long as they improve the effectiveness of the service delivery. Um, then the last one, um, Ori, you talked about the expiration of the vaccine. <laughs> yeah, so uh, we we anticipate, well, there are a lot of uh, <laughs> expiration of, of vaccines. Um, we anticipate, and I think that was why the COVID vaccine delivery platform has uh, supported and continues to support countries to scale up uh, vaccine delivery such that the vaccines will be used up as much as possible um, to minimize expiration. Um, each country has its own reasons uh, why the expiration. Some might be due to uh, maldistribution, perhaps keeping a lot of the expired or distributing vaccines that are near expiry out to the outer provinces and all that. Um, some maybe might be a lot of uh, short uh, shelf life within the country and all that. But we hope uh, that with the integration, um, this will be uh, streamlined into the system. And I, I envisage that you're thinking, perhaps um, as things evolve, uh, the vaccines will have a longer shelf life uh, uh, because I think that is required to, to keep the vaccines within the health facility if need be uh, uh, going forward. So for now, since the vaccines, uh, uh, most of them are emergency use, WHO emergency uh, uh, use listed, um, we hope they will get fully pre-qualified and then with that, they're likely going to be manufactured uh, for longer, with longer shelf life. Uh, Alba, can you come in to supplement? Thank you from my side. Sure. Thank you so much. Maybe what I'm going to supplement only is with the specific country examples that we are aware. For example, which type of electronic registers have been leveraged from COVID to routine immunization or to other um, health system by itself? So low, um, low um, PDR. So what they did is they created their COVID vaccination registry, which is based on the the HIS2 software model. And that what was able to do is to send automatic reminders to be able to support the planning and action at health facility level through detailed reports and dashboards at real time basis of what was happening with COVID vaccine coverage. And the idea was that what they're trying to do, they always had in their plans before the pandemic to create um, a national electronic immunization registry. So now they see the opportunity to use the COVID one to be able to use that one as a platform to include the routine one. So that's one way of doing it. India, for example, they also created an electronic registration system for COVID, they, ca they call it COIN, but that one was able to register priority groups and I was able to identify in the community these priority groups, the ones that I was talking like the elderly, people with comorbidities, pregnant women, to be able to identify them as part of the system and based on that to be able to target them for vaccination. So the idea is if we can do that for COVID, can we do that also as part of a strengthening the adult immunization platform? Indonesia use an, use an app, for example, to be able to have digital home base records of the vaccination in order to be able for everyone to have their registry of immunization in their phones. And that was for COVID, but that could be applied for other vaccines or for children. So these are some examples. And then regarding logistics, I know that Senegal also set up a system um, to be able to track on real time basis what was the situation of the expiry days of the COVID vaccines. And I think it was, I mean, um, o, um, Ori who was mentioning the expiration dates. So in most of the countries or most of the cases, we know that COVID vaccines are, are more are mainly moving towards being managing managed as part of the with the other the rest of the vaccines 
of the immunization program with the idea that the same system could be used also to track what's happening with expiry dates over there. So these are just some examples of what could happen. Of course, the ideal situation would be that it would not only include vaccines, it would be part of the um, national health information system for every single individual one to be able to have vaccines plus other health interventions identified there. But I think taking it step by step and using any innovations that were created in a short time frame for COVID, it's the first step towards integrating it. Thank you very much. Uh, we are kind of uh, uh, short on time for the next session that will be the interactive uh, board, uh, where I will ask for everyone in the community to actually put their hands on and give us uh, some examples and to help us answer some questions. So I'll just give a brief explanation because we have the DevOps, uh, the Dev Global uh, team here, and they will explain uh, very, um, very detailed what each uh, member of the community will uh, be able to do. But uh, mainly, what we will have in this session that it will be a group discussion. It will be we will have in the board uh, key actions uh, for investments that were presented uh, by Alba in, and Ibrahim uh, in their presentation. And we'll ask the community to reflect uh, on some questions that I will I will not go over now and explain in detail because uh, I will ask uh, uh, Jeff uh, to kindly uh, explain that uh, when he will be explaining the board just to, to save us some time. Uh, but mainly just to give you a context, uh, what we want in the end, or what we would like to have is to um, with the support of this community to have a set of uh, recommendations that can be used to uh, direct the focus of the activities of this uh, GIS, uh, WHO, um, uh, UNICEF uh, working group on the context of the COVAX agenda. Um, Jeff, uh, over to you. Uh, I will kindly help you to read the questions. I didn't do it now, but because we are out of time and I really want to hear the community members. Uh, or to see what they have to, to give to us, uh, then I will pass it to you now. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so um, we're going to post a link in the chat to be able to join us in this interactive session. And just real quickly, I'm going to try to do a little setup. And like Anna said, we're a little shorter on time, so we'll we'll adjust these times here. But the idea is, is that we want you to interact with us reacting to this content um, that was just presented uh, as Alba had sort of called out. And uh, we're gonna do two things. One, um, you're gonna vote uh, to which of the areas of investment you see geospatial data and tools bringing the most immediate value uh, for operationalizing and uh, integration. So as they were talking through the integration pieces, and we realized that people in the audience are coming from different perspectives, please bring that perspective and, and whatever level of maturity that you're, you're operating from. Um, the second portion, we'll open it up for some, um, some more direct input. And then instead of voting with this like plus symbol button, you're gonna use the stickies uh, that will be available in each area. And there should be a pile of them there to get started. Um, don't forget to uh, zoom in and out because uh, that helps you create space or sort of uh, uh, adjust things. And then uh, right click also helps you navigate around. We will help um, sort of move things uh, through here. I'm going to stop sharing for a moment so I can set up the first uh, interaction for everybody who's on the board. And then I will uh, bring that back up. So everyone is going to get um, two votes over two minutes um, for the category that they feel uh, should be voted up for areas of interest and investment um, for impact uh, in integration. So I will start and you should be able to join the voting.
Got about a minute left to vote. Ten seconds left. Uh, please try not to borrow my stickies from over here. <laughs> Okay. Highest voting for information management systems and service delivery, and then some some lower drop off kind of from there. Great, in this next activity, we're gonna open it up to two areas of input for participants. One is um, in any given section, oops, try not to borrow my stickies. In any given section here, there are two boxes, one for tools and, and products and services, and another one for improvements. Uh, please go in and where maybe you upvoted, give some information about a tool, product, or service that you're aware of. Um, uh, that are already, and services that are ready uh, and mature to serve the integration priorities that were sort of discussed. Um, if you're unable to contribute to that section, or you can also do both, uh, there's an open response section as mentioned below. How can we better support countries to serve the geospatial needs and requirements of this expanded agenda? I'm gonna set a quick timer for everybody. And I've also left sticky notes uh, that people can grab down in the other area um, for, for a sort of contribution down here in the colored area.
getting to about the minute and a half left for input. Got lots of tools going in there that I can see. Um, if anybody has more suggestions for improvements or sort of open thoughts there, that'd be a great place to contribute in this last uh, minute, minute and a half. Okay, time's up, pencils down. Thank you for everybody for uh, contributing. It looks like we got quite a bit of the crowd in there at some point. The board is still open. So of course, um, if you're still capturing a last note um, or wanna add something after the fact, that's great. And I will hand over to uh, Anna. Thank you very much. It was really, really interesting to see everyone very active uh, in this board. Uh, we see that there's a lot of uh, surveys and tools and uh, a lot of ideas uh, related to data, data standards and population data. So we will wrap this up and uh, thank you very much again for your contribution. Uh, as Jeff said, you can continue to add if you didn't finish. Um, I would like now, because we are really, really in the last minutes, I would like to uh, pass the word to Joana. Uh, that will uh, announce uh, some updates regarding the uh, micro planning uh, handbook. So um, thank you very much again uh, and uh, see you next month. Thank you, Anna. Greetings, everyone. Um, can you please go to the next slide? Thank you. So many of you already know or have been involved um, in the geo-enabled microplanning handbook, um, whether from the scoping and workshops uh, over a year ago to the writing and reviewing of the document. Um, but for a little of background uh, for those that aren't aware, um, the geo-enabled microplanning handbook was initiated uh, last year by the COVAX GIS working group um, with the objective to document and fill um, knowledge gaps in the um, geo-enabled uh, microplanning process. Um, and for background on the microplanning process uh, and the geo-enablement process, um, it is the process of integrating geospatial data and technologies into various stages of microplanning. And the process, as many know, are not is not always simple and straightforward. Um, and it involves uh, requiring the supporting environment, data and information, technology, capacity, and financial resources that must be available across different levels of microplanning to be successful. Um, so using um, various background material and existing guidance from organizations such as WHO IVB team, including our colleagues today, um, UNICEF, Gavi, Health Enabled, and the GeoLab Collaborative, Health GeoLab Collaborative, uh, we, we, pulled, um, we pulled 113 individuals uh, to, uh, to contribute their expertise and knowledge uh, to this handbook, which is a practical step-by-step -step guide to how to geo-enable a micro plan. Um, and we are finally coming to the, the later stages of this process and we'll be publishing the document um, later this year. 
And we are also developing in the company e-learning course um, that will also be released at the end of the year. Um, so if you are interested in, in more information about that, please do reach out and be in touch. And otherwise, uh, please stay tuned for more. Thank you. Back to you, Anna. Well, I will use the last minute to, uh, to thank again everyone into this community for all the contributions that you have provided today. Thank you. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye.